You are officially invited. Yes, you. You're invited to join us in Fertility Awareness Mastery Live. This is my eight-week group coaching program designed to help you gain confidence using fertility awareness. Whether you're actively avoiding pregnancy or looking to optimize your cycles for conception, we have a spot for you. We start the first week of May. Are you ready to jump in? Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash fam to register today. That's fertilityfriday.com slash F-A-M. This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 358. Welcome to the Fertility Friday Podcast, your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm your host, Lisa Hendrickson-Jack. I'm the author of The Fifth Vital Sign and the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Journal. I'm a certified fertility awareness educator and holistic reproductive health practitioner with nearly 20 years of experience teaching women to connect to their fifth vital sign through menstrual cycle charting, balancing hormonal health, and optimizing the menstrual cycle without hormones. I'm outspoken about hormonal birth control and its impact on fertility and overall health because you have the right to know how your body works and how artificial hormones disrupt that natural process. I host live coaching programs to help you achieve optimal fertility and health because it's important to have healthy menstrual cycles regardless of whether or not you want to have babies. I'm also a wife and mother of two beautiful boys. I know, I know, I'm a busy girl, but I managed to fit it all in. This podcast is designed to empower you to take full control of your cycles, your fertility, and your overall health. And I'm so excited that you're here with us today. Today, I'm sharing a brand new episode in my Fertility Awareness Reality Series. And in today's episode, I'm sharing my interview with my client, Liz, who was a member of my recent Fertility Awareness Mastery Live group program. And in her case, she came off of the pill several months before she joined the program. She was cycling, but her cycles have been inconsistent and irregular. And so in today's episode, we talk about that and we talk about the post-pill transition phase. And so without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into today's episode with Liz. And I'm excited to be here today with Liz. Liz is a member of my current Fertility Awareness Mastery program, and we're about just about midway through, I would say. So a great time to have a a private public conversation on air. Uh, So welcome to the show, Liz. Hello. Um, Well, thank you for being here and coming on the show. I'd love just to start by giving you a chance to share a little bit about your background more specifically, you know, when you got your first period and what that was like, and um, if you've ever used birth control. So I guess the birth control history and what led you to opt for fertility awareness at this stage. Yeah. So I, I got my first period. I want to say it was, I want to say it was sixth grade. So what is that? 11, 12 in that range. But then, you know, I don't think I had it again until like six months down the line, eight months down the line. So, you know, you get your first one and you're like, oh my gosh, what is this? And then, you know, you're spared a few months and then it finally actually like really starts. I don't remember much of my period pre-high school, but in high school, I do remember it being ever so heavy. I have been cursed with that. So that was one of the main reasons I did go on birth control in high school. I remember sitting in class and bleeding through a tampon and through a pad and like being terrified to stand up kind of situation. And what are class periods like 45 minutes in length. So they were very heavy in high school. So I did go to the gynecologist and was put on birth control. Like that was the end of the discussion. It was like, Oh, we'll fix it. We'll put you on birth control. No problem. And like, that was it. Like no questions for me. I I mean, I was 18 at this point. So I had made it mostly through high school. It was senior year of high school, but like there was no explanation to, you know, what it's, what it does, how it works. It was just birth control. So I was on it for 16 years. So went on it at 18. So it it was a long time. And in that stretch, there was maybe only a six month time when I wasn't on it. And it took that long for my period to actually come back. And when it did, it came back even heavier than I remembered it from high school. So it's, it's been a journey. 
I remember switching many different types of birth control. I want to say the first one I was on was the one where you are only supposed to have a period once every three months. So you take the active hormones for three months and then you have a period. Well, it didn't work out that way. I remember just having a period for months at a time. So we switched off of that one. Just, you know, constant switching for the first few years, I want to say, and then finally landed on something that I felt worked. It made my periods predictable. They weren't much lighter, I want to say, but I think they were manageable. And it, having gone through it for so long, manageable is just, it's still probably quite heavy for some people. So anyway, cut to around, when was it? It was 2019. So I'm trying to remember where we're at in the Groundhog Day of, you know, 2020, 2021. So it was right around Thanksgiving. And I remember this because it's the day after Thanksgiving. It's Black Friday. Everybody's out shopping and I just had cabin fever. So I went wandering around, ended up in a Barnes and Noble, just looking for books. And I came across uh, the book, This Is Your Brain on Birth Control, I believe the title is. And I started flipping through it because of course it caught my eye and just like panic came over my face of like, oh my gosh, what am I taking? What have I been taking for the past 16 years? So I kind of panic read that in the Barnes and Noble, went home, started looking at all of these different books on my Kindle that I could download and read and just kind of deep dive into this world of you know, what the birth control is doing to your body and to your brain and, and things like that. So I think I downloaded like three or four books, including yours, and just kind of went into this deep dive of, I really have never questioned what it is that the birth control is doing. And if I'm being quite honest, I'm not sure I really knew exactly how it worked because you have these discussions with your friends and you're in college and high school and all of your friends are, you know, by the time you get to college, all of your friends, or at least most of your friends are on birth control. It's just how it is. And, you know, we never question it. We never really talk about it. And it's, and it's, it's just a, a thing you do. And, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for it. I avoided pregnancy. I managed at least my, my period as best that I knew how, but then, you know, reading everything, it's like, wow, maybe this really isn't the best option for me at this time. And I slowly started questioning it actually with my gynecologist because I am 35. So by the time I want to say last year, when I went to my appointment, I was, you know, 34. And it's like in every ad you hear is birth control and blood clots and age 35. And it's like, okay, so I'm at that age. Like, is this the time when I should be considering to come off of it, you know, as you get older, your body starts doing different things. And um, the gynecologist wasn't concerned. He's like, oh, because you're not a smoker, you're fine. It's, it's not a big deal. But, you know, I just, it was always in the back of my mind. So then when I came across these books, it was like, oh, no, maybe, maybe we really should have come off of this many, many years ago. So thankfully, you know, found the books that kind of turned the light on for me. And I immediately booked an appointment with a naturopath because again, in, in all of your books and in everyone's books, it, you are doubted by the gynecologist. And I was coming up on an appointment and I brought it up with him and he was like, oh, so what are you going to use for birth control? And I said, fertility awareness. And he said, oh, okay. And he just, <laughs> he sounded very doubtful, but, uh, started working with a naturopath and we did a lot of blood tests and I was concerned mainly for coming off of it, of just the, the rebound of the hormones and the potential hair loss and the potential acne and, and things like that. So worked with her and uh, just wanted to avoid any kind of post pill rebound. So did all the blood tests just to kind of see where everything was and she gave me some supplements and things like that. And we've been monitoring that. So long story short, came off of birth control in March, 2020. And so it is now almost a year later and still, you know, just kind of on this journey of getting my period back to being normal. 
and at least normal for me and, you know, feeling confident in the fertility awareness method. And it's, it's definitely a learning curve, <laughs> but um, so far it's been, it's been a fun journey and it's just, it's, I feel, I feel more in control of my body and, and how it's, and how it's working and knowing that it is actually working and that it's not just through, you know, a synthetic hormone. So. Well, thank you for taking us through that. I mean, it's always fascinating to hear essentially decades of your life, at least one aspect of your life in a short period of time. And I think there's so much of your story that so many of us can relate to. And one of the things that stood out to me, uh, of course, was your sentiments around the pill, right? Like, see, you, you're like minding your own business in a bookstore. <laughs> All of a sudden, you see Sarah Hill's book. Uh, so I have, I have an interview with Sarah Hill. I'll link it about her book, This Is Your Brain on Birth Control. And I mean, it's a fabulous book full of research about literally how the, the pill affects your brain and your hormones and all these different things, your emotions. And, and, and I, I actually, I saw, I had a message, I think earlier today that I looked at um, from someone on social media who kind of had the same thing. It's like, I just found your podcast and I'm freaking out, <laughs> right? Because it's like, what did I do? I did it. So I just, I feel like it's a good thing to just acknowledge that although there is a lot of information about birth control, I mean, certainly there's a ton of research around the, the effects that it can have. The message that I want to drive home is that even though it can feel really overwhelming, we all do what we can based on what we know at the time. And there's, there's no use of beating yourself up. I think the good news is that when especially, I mean, I can come off as really anti-pill. If you read my pill chapters and don't get at least a little bit pissed off, then I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but the good, the good news is that when you look at the research, there are effects. There are definitely effects, but there's, the research itself doesn't show that these effects are necessarily permanent. They're reversible. The body does rebound back. And there's a lot of ways to manage any potential ill effects that happen. So I feel like if we can ground ourselves in that, then although it feels like, of course, like that there's a need to freak out and worry and wonder, I think that on the flip side, and this is a horrible thing, but I think medical professionals, many medical professionals are trained to not talk about the side effects because they uh, think that women will freak out. And so there's this interesting line, right? But it's like, if I'm taking this medication, I do have the right to know what it could be doing to me, even if it means I freak out. <laughs> right. But at the same time, I think that there, the other thing I wanted to say was that in your case, you had a legitimate and quite serious concern around your bleeding. And so again, we do the best we can with what we know at the time. So you were making a decision to help yourself to manage this. And it's a legitimate, obviously, it's never good to lose too much blood. Um, and so I, I just wanted to say that, and I think you can appreciate it and all the listeners can appreciate it as well, because this is never about shaming us and, oh, I did something wrong. It's literally, in my opinion, about sharing information so that when we do learn other ways to cope, that we can make the choices that are appropriate at that point. Right. And I think, you know, given given the information at the time, which was nothing, you know, <laughs> it, it, that, that was the, you know, and you're, you're, you're meant to trust your doctors and, and things like that. And I mean, I was a senior in high school. My mom was in the room with me and we just, she wasn't informed. I wasn't informed. And I, I don't pin that on anyone, you know, but it's, it's, it is just the looking back and that, that twinge of just anger of how can no one tell you, so, you know, and again, like information wasn't as readily, I'm making myself sound like I'm 50 million years old. But, but a like, lot has changed. Yeah. Like I can relate because I'm not uh, 80 years old, but when I was 18, it was a different world. There was no smartphones, legitimately none. There was no social media. The internet was kind of newly a thing. I had just gotten my, I got my first computer when I was 17 years old and went off to, cause I was 17 because of my, the, you know, born in November, November, yeah. baby. but I was, <laughs> but I was 17 when I went to university and that was the first time I ever had my own computer in my house currently, because we've had some, I don't even know why, but we have like five laptops in our house. <laughs> like 
I mean, I, I kind of spilled tea on her laptop and it kind of got, you know what I mean? So we still have it and the kids use it, but I'm just saying like each there's enough, there's more than one laptop per human in my house. And when the world was different. Right. And it, and it was, and yeah, the same thing. Like I didn't get my first cell phone until at some point in my senior year and it was a flip phone and I loved it. Yeah. So, so yeah. So like, I wasn't able to, or again, you probably could, but it wasn't as readily available to, to research like, Oh, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be eating as much dairy. Like maybe that's causing, or at least lending an effect to, or, you know, all of the information that I have now in this deep dive of this past year that my poor friends are probably so sick of hearing me on. It's just, it is, it's a different time. And, and thankfully now we are at the information superhighway kind of thing where you can, you can find all this info to help any kind of situation you have. So. Well, there was, I mean, back then you would have literally had to go to the library and like the actual library and based on the books that were actually physically present at the library and you would have just have to you would have had to sift through you know whatever was there right so very very different time mm -hmm. and so one question I have for you now that you came off birth control so you know when we get into the charting but how did you find your bleeding you know since you come off birth control you've been off for about a year now you've had several bleeds. We talked about that in our hot seat. Yep. Not all were ovulatory, but we kind of sorted some of that stuff out. Anyways, how was the bleeding? So it took, so I came off in March and I think, I think my first period was in May, like end of May. So it, it took a cycle, you know, for it to be like, all oh, right, we're going to do this and it's going to be a real period. And the first one back was, was very heavy. So that was alarming. I had emailed my naturopath like, this isn't working. And she's like, I'm not concerned. Your body is just kind of restarting itself. It's going to be this way. Just give it a beat. So, okay. My panic subsided and it's been, it's been manageable and it's, it's been much like it was on birth control, if not even maybe a little bit shorter uh, I can still, you know, go in and be like, okay, I need to change my tampon on day two every X hours and to avoid any kind of leaking. So it's, it's very predictable. The end of it is where it's like, oh, I have some blood this day, but then I'll, I won't have any the next day. And then there'll be just a smidge of it the next day. But in terms of heaviness, it's maybe even just a smidge lighter but that's good. But I'm also like, I'm factoring in my diet and the supplements that I'm currently on to, to help. Um, because when we did do the initial testing, my iron was super, super low. So I'm, I'm on that and, you know, different things like that. So I think the whole process has been positive in terms of, you know, where my bleeding is right now. Is it still heavier than I would in an ideal world wants, yes, but it's, it's totally manageable. Well, and let's quantify it a little bit because this is something that we didn't get into a ton in your previous hot seat. So how many days does your period last? And so on the heavy or moderate days, uh, how, well, first of all, how do you collect your, your menstruation? During the day, I, like when I'm at the office, I use tampons, but I am in the process of trying to migrate more toward the menstrual cup. At night, I do sleep with a menstrual cup because having a tampon in that long freaks me out. So I sleep with a menstrual cup and have never had any issues. I love it at night. It's the, the changing of it process. Yeah. So I'm, <laughs> I think I, I really do think I just need to buy a second one and just swap them out and then just wash that one and not try and mess with the cleaning of the, the dirty one in the stall while managing, you know, it's just a lot to manage. <laughs> well, we could go into the TMI and I, we, I, I could share with you. So I'll, I'll put a pin in that and I'll, I'll, I'll go full TMI in a minute. So then when you're using your tampons, how frequently are you changing? So on my heaviest day, I will go through a super plus in three hours and that's the entire day. So you're having and to change every two to three hours kind of thing? It's, it's almost three hours on the dot. There will, and that's, that's, that's the nice predictability of it is I can look at the clock and be like, oh, I got to go. You know, it's just, it's time. 
and there will be like a rare occasion throughout that full. It's, you know, if I start like mid afternoon on day one, that will be my day two is three hours, a super plus tampon. It's time to change. Um, and there will be a rare occasion where it, you know, it barely starts to leak at three hours or it won't be completely full at three hours, but like the next one will be. So it's, it's for the most part, very predictable in that sense. And is there like just one day like that or two days like that? There is, it's mostly one day, you know, the day after will be more like I could go for four and a half hours on a super plus tampon. And then it really tapers off after that. I think this last period I had like my day two was my heavy one. And then day three was kind of the medium where I can go four, four and a half hours in one tampon. And then my next day was just light, which light to me is maybe, maybe filling a regular every three hours. Like that's my light, you know, and maybe that's only one or two tampons in a day. And then I won't fill a regular one for the rest of the day. Okay. And, but your period is over. We'll pull up your charts here. So I know the listeners won't be able to see your charts, but but you list your period as five days. So it does, it doesn't go on and on forever. It does. end. At some yes. Point. <laughs> yes, it does. It does end. And, uh, and it's, it's been about five days for the past, the past three or four cycles at least. So, and part of me remembers having like a full seven day cycle on birth control. And now it's like, that's so far gone that I don't even remember. And of course, when you're on birth control, you're not paying as close attention maybe to your period as one should be. So, you know, since I've been charting, it feels like five days is pretty, is pretty standard, which is a nice change. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, certainly that is, that is heavy. So like it's, it's obviously heavy, but, and this is actually what we're going to be talking about today in our class, as long as we have enough time to get through it, but the normal parameters of the menstrual cycle, but the top end when I was looking through the research of what is considered normal bleeding, there were some researchers that said that the top end of normal should be about 60 mill- milliliters. Uh, but generally speaking, 80 milliliters is kind of the top. And that's something like four to five ounces. I'd have to check the specific measurement. But what that would mean, the 80 milliliters would be, mean that you would fill one menstrual cup. That's A menstrual cup is usually about an ounce, depending on the size. Uh, you would fill it about five times a whole cycle. What? (laughs) Yeah. So we'll be going through that. Yeah. And we'll, we'll be doing a little demo because that makes it a little bit more real. So in terms of uh, this is, it's interesting timing. So it's not, it hasn't been released at the time that we're recording this. Um, But I recently released an episode that was specifically about bleeding disorders, something that the, the individuals who I interviewed were talking about being a rare, like a, it's it's not a it's not so common, but it's also not so rare. But it's also something that they were telling me is not well known by a lot of physicians. So although you've probably been screened for all kinds of things, they've probably done ultrasounds to screen you for fibroids and you know polyps and things of that nature. What they were telling me was that it's not necessarily something that is automatically looked at as a p- possibility. So certainly I wouldn't be the one to be able to say whether or not you fit that criteria, but certainly just having that knowledge that there could be potentially something there, particularly because of a few things that you mentioned, you were on the pill and you mentioned that it didn't really like lower the bleeding a whole lot, like it lowered it a little bit. Um, And so it was basically still the same volume. So we can talk more about that in our upcoming classes, but that's just something I wanted to say, partly because it's on the top of my mind because I just did the interview that you'll, you'll hear on the podcast eventually, but, but that's, a, isn't that, isn't that an interesting thing that there is a percentage of women who have bleeding disorders that would cause them to have heavy bleeding, but they would really have to kind of push for it and have kind of that background knowledge to ask for that type of referral to get that type of testing. Cause it, it, it's not something that would be automatically screened for. I think that that's also very interesting and potentially aggravating. Yeah. I, I, potentially aggravating for sure of like, again, like feeling silenced when you know your body. And it's like, no, like this, this isn't right. 
you know, or this, this shouldn't be that way. And like, I know my body, so please help me. (laughs) Well, and one of the things that they pointed out in the interview was that So like anything else that we've talked about on the podcast, so whether that's irregular cycles or um, that you're being put on the pill to quote regulate or whether it's pain that you're being put on the pill to minimize, those scenarios obviously help us to manage the symptoms, which is very helpful, especially when we're teenagers just trying to live. It's, It's really helpful to have symptom management. But of course, the problem becomes, A, when you actually want to start a family, if there's an underlying problem, then you've kind of put it off and now you still have to address it if you're wanting to, to figure that out. But then also, if there's an actual health condition underlying, one of the things they said is that if it, if it does happen to be the case that a woman has a bleeding disorder, but of course, she was put on the pill to manage it, then it can cause a problem potentially when she's having a baby and then be identified when she starts hemorrhaging, you know. So obviously, I'm just sharing this for information. And like I said, it's something we'll talk about more, but it's something that it it makes sense that it would be good to rule something like that out just in case. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and thinking back, like, I'm sure it helped a little bit, you know, the birth control and the bleeding. And again, high school was so long ago, that it's hard to it's hard to picture like what it actually was. I do just remember sitting in class and like bleeding through whatever size tampon I had in and panicking and being like, this can't be life. So, and yeah, but knowing that I am definitely on the heavy side, it's like, there's always been that, like, this can't be normal. Like I have, there's so much happening, you know, during my period that I'm the, like my friends aren't, you know, and that's how we, we quantify everything is my friends. They, they aren't dealing with this. So no, it's all the information is just, it's very fascinating. And it's like a sponge taking it all in now. And then knowing like, okay, next time I go to my gynecologist, like maybe I really should bring this up. Cause I don't know if we've ever really talked about it because I was on birth control and it was all fine and dandy, you know, but actually like bringing the attention back to it of like, now that I'm a grown adult and I know what I'm doing with my body, like, let's address this and, you know, see what, see what he has to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I mean, when it comes to period issues, things that it's the whole concept of using the menstrual cycle as, as a vital sign. One of the things I'm always telling my clients is that, you know, if we're seeing these signs and we know it could mean these things, then it does make sense to get thee to the doctor and get those, just do everything by, by the list, like check it, check it off. You know, of course we, with your s- symptoms, it's, um, it's been consistent for all this time. So in a different example, if a woman's cycles were always kind of one way and all of a sudden she starts flooding, right? Then you got to screen for things like just make sure it's not anything real serious. Make sure it's not uterine can't like, you know what I mean? Because it's a different thing if it all of a sudden shifts. But anyways, I just wanted to, to say that. And I think that this is, again, why it's so important to track the cycle and to understand what's normal and what's not. And really kind of when you have that sense that, OK, there could be something wrong just to keep pushing until you get some answers. Mm hmm. So let's jump into the charting part or the uh, session part of today's on-air session. And so last time we did go through the charts that you have had for the past year, we kind of looked through and analyzed those. And so let me know what was kind of on the top of your mind today, um, what you wanted to, to make sure we talked about. So I, I like the idea of checking your cervix as just a third sign because I just, I think my OCD doesn't allow me not to (laughs) just having, you know, another thing to look at. But I think, and I, we've talked about this in class, how it's just, it's, it's a process. So I think checking that is still questionable. And when I think like earlier in the week, I feel like I was like, Oh, I think that's it. I think that's what I'm looking for. And then yesterday and today, I felt like I couldn't find it again. And I guess that's a question too, is like, I know that that's the whole point is that it shifts and it moves and that's part of checking it. But I, I don't know if I'm, I don't think I'm ovulating yet, but so is it possible for it to kind of be harder to find some days than others, even though you're not at that stage in your cycle yet? Yes, definitely. Um, So uh, one of the things that I often joke about is, I mean, so just the, the basics, like we had talked about before, when you're approaching ovulation, you know, under the influence of estrogen, it causes the cervix to change position as well as the texture. 
And so when it's moving into essentially a higher position in the vagina for some women, when they're checking their cervix, the sign that they're approaching fertility is that the cervix kind of goes so high that they have a hard time reaching it. One of the things that you can try, and you may have tried this already, but you can try squatting when you're checking. And it's possible that if you're actually squatting that you might, it might be a bit easier (laughs) to find it. But certainly I would put that as a comment, you know, like yesterday I could find it and today I can't. And that potentially, I mean, I I think about all these things because this is what I do all day, but we all have different size feet. So it makes sense that, I mean, our vaginas are on the inside. You know, I, I, I will never know how long your vagina is compared to mine, but I'm guessing that we're not all exactly the same and our fingers aren't even the same size. So it makes perfect sense that for some women, it might be harder to find Uh, But yes, that in of itself would be a sign. I would try the squatting. I do see you noting, like certainly there is, there was a difference kind of towards the beginning of the cycle and obviously also towards the end. So towards the end of your previous cycle, you were noting the cervix as essentially low. Right. Well, and I think at this point, this is still me guessing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Which is okay. (laughs) uh, Until I actually feel comfortable. So by no means am I taking my cervix charting like into full consideration. It's more of like a, a trial and error and the, and the website you sent, I think is also helpful because it gives me like a visual of me seeing like, is that what it, okay. So like, I'm picturing the picture, but like, is that what I feel like I'm feeling? <laughs> so, so that's really helpful. But at this point it, it, I still feel like it's very much a guessing game because I'm not a hundred percent sure what I'm looking for is actually what it is. Yes. So that is totally normal. The website that you were referring to is the Beautiful Cervix Project. So we can search that and it'll be in the show notes too. And uh, so that is just literally pictures. So women with speculums gone wild, right? Like, so it's an actual pic- pictures of the cervix, but also pictures of the cervix throughout the menstrual cycle. And I don't know when that website came to be, but I know that it existed when I was in my like first second year of university. So it's a website that I've been referring <laughs> referring clients to for a long time. And it does help because the cervix is an internal organ. Most of us have never seen it unless, I mean, some of us have really cool doctors. I have never had this experience, but some of us have really cool doctors who will offer to show you the cervix. So they'll have the speculum and like, do you want to see it? And so they'll have the mirror and, and you can buy your own if you want. <laughs> science experiment. Uh, You don't have to though. Um, But anyway, so it's helpful sometimes to see what it looks like because it kind of looks like it's like the end of your nose is kind of a sort of a good example of it sort of, but it's, it's kind of, if you see it, then it's like, oh, that's what that is. So this is your first full cycle of checking the cervix. My recommendation to, you know, when you're wanting to check the cervix, so it's an optional sign, you don't have to check it if you don't want to, but certainly Um, it can be really helpful is to check it once a day, every day for a full cycle. And you are in the middle of it. And you're also in the stage before you've ovulated. So you haven't yet felt the shift. So there's the biggest shift is once you ovulate the kind of pre ovulatory cervix and the post ovulatory cervix, that is kind of the biggest shift in position and texture and firmness and openness and all those uh, good qualities. And so when you ovulate, that is when it'll be like, oh, so the first cycle, you, you never feel, you never feel like you know what's going on in the first cycle. But what I can tell you, because I see I'm on the other end of this, is that even though you don't know <laughs> and you don't necessarily feel confident, when I'm looking at your notations, what I can tell you is that even though you're not confident, there's one day where it feels one way and one day where it feels another way. Okay. That much I can tell. So we're not quite there yet because uh, you haven't it doesn't, you know, you haven't ovulated just yet, but that in of itself. So the goal is literally just to figure out how your cervix feels in the fertile window and how that's different from how it feels once you've ovulated essentially. Okay. Yeah. Cause I feel like I'm, I'm searching for like this big prominent, like nose feeling thing. And I'm like, what? Am I? <laughs> yeah. And again, like you said, it's internal. So like you're going in blind and it's just kind of feeling around and wondering. And like, I felt like I felt like a little nub on like Saturday or Sunday, and then it's, it's gone. And I do, I do squat TMI, everyone. I do squat to find it. And like, sometimes I just feel like there's nothing that I'm feeling for. Well, and so again, that's something I would note 
Okay. Because you might find that when you're, you know, at quote peak fertility, that your cervix is higher and you might find that when it's harder to reach or when you can't really reach it, you might find that that correlates with that stage of your cycle. So that's just something to keep in mind. But my advice is always keep going. <laughs> I know you want to curse me a little, but it will definitely make more sense if you kind of force yourself to check it once a day for the full cycle. And yeah. And if the squatting doesn't actually bring it into be like, you, yeah. So the only thing, the cervix is the base of the uterus. It's the part of the uterus that opens and dilates when you have a baby. And so the only thing at the end of the vagina is the cervix. There's nothing else up there. So. Right. Well, and, and that's the thing too. It's like, am, am I up farther? Am I like positioned wrong? Like, am I feeling back instead of, I, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a, it's a whole question mark, but also too, like I question it because it is day 15 and I haven't been ovulating until like day 32. So I'm like, I can't possibly not find it yet because heaven forbid I ovulate when I'm supposed to. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to jump into today's episode to invite you to join us for the next round of Fertility Awareness Mastery Live. My eight-week group coaching program is designed to help you unlock the secrets of your menstrual cycle. Fertility Awareness Mastery teaches you everything you need to know about using fertility awareness cycle tracking to achieve your intentions. Whether you're trying to get pregnant, avoid pregnancy, or planning to conceive in the future, we've got you covered. This program goes deep. Get to the root of your period problems, hormone imbalances, fertility challenges, and so much more. Early bird registration is now open, but only for a limited time. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash fam to register today. That's fertilityfriday.com slash fam. Now let's jump back into today's episode. Well, so we'll just, it's kind of like a to be announced. And one thing that we've seen a bit of is that uh, currently in your cycles, you haven't necessarily seen a ton of cervical fluid. So that's also something that we're, so um, even though you very well could be approaching ovulation right now, you're not getting the mucus sign as of yet. And so that's something that does happen to a certain percentage of women when they're coming off birth control, especially long-term birth control. So it's certainly something that we'll work on together, but that in and of itself makes it a bit more challenging because uh, just because I'm sure at least someone was wondering like, what about the mucus? And so currently in your cycle, we have yet to see mucus. Correct. Well, in this, yeah, right now in this cycle, I haven't seen any. And then on the cycles that I have ovulated, I see it the day I ovulate and that is it. And it's like, Ooh, smooth lubricative. Okay. That means I'm ovulating right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we'll keep watching that, but yes, keep checking. And I did mention that I was going to go all TMI on you. So if you want, I could share with you a few tips and tricks about, I obviously you don't have to check or you don't have to change your a cup when you're working. But so I did, you know, I have used a cup for like 20 years. And so I did actually check, change it in the bathroom. So I'll share with you <laughs> a couple of options for how this can happen. Yeah. And then I'll let, I'll kind of leave the rest to you for you to decide if you ever want to do it. Um, so one of the benefits, especially for heavier bleeders, because I am also on the heavier side, you know, because I have fibroids is really what I've determined to be the biggest contributor to that. So I, like I mentioned, it is TMI, but because of that, I found that the cup was helpful because I, w I wasn't having to change as frequently because a cup could hold a bit more. So in terms of changing, so when you are in a place, a magical place that has a single stall, so it's just you and the door, that is the best case scenario, obviously. And so in a situation like that, you wash your hands and then you go to the toilet and then you, you take it out and you dump it. And you can actually, you know, rinse it out in the sink and then reinsert. So that's the best case scenario when you're in public. But we all know that where, <laughs> when you're outside of your house, you don't always have a single stall toilet. So what can you do? So I'm going to share a couple of options. So option one, so you go into the public stall, you wash your hands, right, in the sink. Now I'm just going to share what I do. I'm sure there's better ways out there, but I'm just going to share uh, two kind of options. So one of the things that I would do is they have usually, you know, the kind of harder, um, the paper that you wipe your hands with in the bathrooms. <laughs> That's another thing, right? Because now there's a lot of bathrooms that don't have that because they just have the, the air. 
but anyway, so if they have the paper towels, you can, I, I would usually take a couple of paper towels and just fold it and kind of like wet it a little bit and take it into the stall with me. So option A is literally just to take it out, dump it, kind of wipe it off a little bit, and then just insert it back. And so that might sound really gross, but again, I've been using cups for 20 years. It's not ideal, but when you're in public, you just kind of do that. And then of course, when you get back home, you change it properly, wash it off. But I guess my point is that although for newer cup users, it might seem like, holy cow, you could put it back in without washing, like without fully, right, cleansing it. And, but I'm just being real with you and it, it is what it is. And it's not, and it, it's, it's, it's fine because it's not all the time. It's just when you're, okay, right. so option one. So option two, which might be more favorable, especially to the, the part of the audience that I just lost because they think it's so gross, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just being honest. Okay, so option two, and plenty of women do this as well, just get a water bottle, put in your purse. And then when you take out the cup, you just dump it and then you rinse it. And then it's also helpful to have like the paper towel, right? Um, in this process, in the bathroom while you're sitting on the toilet, <laughs> but just to give it a rinse and then you just put it back in. And so I would just kind of wrap up the paper towel and put it in the tampon box. But so those are two options of how this works. Um, and certainly then, you know, you just go back out and wash your hands again. But yeah, so I'm sure there are other ways. I'm sure plenty of people have other ways to do it, but bringing a water bottle in to kind of rinse off is certainly a good option as is to have, even if you, I wouldn't, I don't know about buying wipes because they might have chemicals on them and things like that. So I'm more comfortable with the paper towel water wipe off option, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm sure that you could come up with something. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And, and I've actually found too, and again, like this might not even be a thing, but at least since I have been off birth control, I have been playing with the, with the menstrual cups more and, and initially, like, I wasn't a fan of them during the day because I feel like they sit funny against your bladder, mm -hmm. but, but somehow like now that I'm off birth control, and again, this might not even be a thing, but it feels like it sits differently. So I don't know if like my cervix has moved or something has moved in there, but it, I don't feel like it pushes as much against my bladder now. So it's not as hard to sit in for a long period of time throughout the day. And again, like, I think it, they just get, they are, you have to get used to them for sure. And I'm trying different versions of them to see like one of them's more like a disc. And then the one I sleep in is more like an actual cup that kind of suctions. So it's, it's finding the versions that, that feel right and fit and stay in place. But for some reason it feels better like now during the day than it did like a year ago. So it is just getting used to the, the whole changing bit when you aren't in the comfort of your own home. But yes. hey, it's been 2020. So we've all been comfortable in our yeah. own homes. Yeah, it's probably been a really good year for menstrual cups. <laughs> I would imagine. Yeah, for all the menstrual cup manufacturers, because it's like, well, I'm not going to work. So I can't, I can use it now. Right. Um, or not going outside my home to work, I should say. But yeah, so this is, uh, I'm sure, hopefully helpful to, because to I think that's kind of one of the biggest things of like, but what happens if I have to change and I'm not at home? And it really isn't the end of the world, but it is something that you would have to get comfortable with and figure out what, what kind of way is going to work for you. And in terms of the pushing on the bladder, I would say that that's a real thing. I'm, I'm sure that it, you know, when you're on birth control, it is a hormone, so it certainly could have an effect on where your cervix is situated to some extent. That's not out of the realm of possibility, but certainly that is a, is a thing. So sometimes it's easier to actually fully empty your bladder at a quick, normal rate when you remove the cup, even mm -hmm. if like you can certainly urinate with the cup in, but there's sometimes depending on the, how everything's organized down there where it's easier to remove the cup so that it's easier. So it's not pushing on your bladder. And of course there's different sizes and different, firmnesses of cups and all of those types of things. So uh, it's certainly a, a significant conversation, but hopefully it's helpful at least to go over some of the options so that it doesn't feel as daunting. And so that, you know, okay, I can do this if I want to. And then, Hey, if it doesn't work out, you can always just go back to the tampon. <laughs> right. Right. And I think part of me too. And like, that's, I'm so used to tracking my flow based on what I fill a tampon that that's like the comfortable part 
for me now. Whereas like, you know, at night I take out the diva cup and you try and look at it and you're like, okay, is that full? Yeah, I think so. Or is that half full? So it's, it's, that's a little bit of a guessing game. And then, you know, like, okay, I went five hours with it in, does that equate like what it would be like with X amount of tampons? So it's, it's just adjusting my, my calculations of my period. Mm -hmm. Well, and one other thing, I think that your alternative of getting a second cup, so many women would be more comfortable with that option as well. So you just, you'd still have to get a plastic bag or something. And then you just put it in the plastic bag and change it. So I, I don't necessarily think it's necessary to buy two cups, but I also think that it's a lot different now than when I started using cups. There's like a hundred companies that make all kinds of cups and all kinds of sizes. So, and many women do have multiple cups. So it certainly would also, if you're comfortable with that as an option, and if that makes it easier, I think that that would be just as suitable of an option. You just have to remember to put your little baggie in there and you're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, menstrual cups for the win today. So before we wrap up our call, were there any other topics you wanted to talk about? I, I don't think so. I know we, we've talked about it in class of like how, you know, my, we're hoping my mucus finally comes back, even though it's been a year, there were some, some hiccups early on with my cycles. So just hoping that mucus becomes more of a telling factor as we move forward. Cause I know you mentioned that it can take like nine months to a year for your cycles to actually normalize, I believe. Well, so there's a research study that showed that when they measured all the different cycle parameters, so including overall cycle length, mucus patterns, luteal phase length, so the period of time between ovulation and your period, and then follicular phase length. But when they measured all the different aspects of the cycle, on average, it took about nine to 12 cycles for the group of women who had just come off of birth control to have basically the same parameters of their control group, women who had never been on birth control. And so nine to 12 cycles can mean, you know, 12 to 18 months more. What I would say is it's not so typical that I see women have absolutely no mucus, you know, multiple cycles in. Certainly, I do have a certain percentage of clients who come off birth control, and even though they're ovulating the first, let's say, three to four, three to five cycles, there's no mucus or very limited mucus, but the good news is that it usually does improve. And then we did speak about some of the ways that we can support mucus production and support the cervix and you know replenish some of the, those nutrients. That doesn't happen instantly. It usually takes, I would say, two to three cycles. For instance, if you start supplementing, replenishing some B vitamins and things like that. It, it doesn't, it's obviously not instant. It's not like you take a vitamin on Monday and it's like, wow, look at this <laughs> mucus. So as, uh, as your body starts to replenish, certainly um, I've seen that improve on the, the chart. And so that's something that we can, can keep working on. Okay, great. Yeah. And then, it, yeah. And then it's just, I'm at some point, And again, like, as I mentioned, I'm working with a naturopath and I'm, I'm on multiple supplements. So it, at this point, it's like, once we get comfortable with where I am and get blood work done again and things, I'm just looking to see what supplements I can kind of come off of or what are, you know, going to be kind of like a mainstay, which I'm, which I'm fine with, you know, cause I know like, for example, my testosterone is high. So maybe that's one that I kind of have to stay on again to help regulate my period, but also so I don't grow a beard. So things like that. So I'm, I'm just, you know, looking at, at what is in a good range and then what is kind of more of like a long term in terms of like blood levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is the kind of like the tricky part. I think there's, there's a book called like the messy middle or something like this is the tricky part because you're in the midst of this transitional phase. And so although it's been a year and that it can feel like, oh my gosh, it's been a whole year. I don't remember off the top of my head exactly how many true menstrual periods you've had, but I believe that it's like three or four. Yeah. I want to say this one, this current cycle is cycle four. Yeah. And that's four cycles where you ovulated and actually had a bleed as a right. result of ovulation. Yeah. So this is the tricky part of like when I share things like this study showed nine to 12 cycles, because for many women in that first year, they may only have three or four cycles. It depends. I wouldn't say that that's so common, but it is possible if it takes you two to three months to have your first ovulation and your cycles don't 
fall into normal parameters right away. Like they're longer. It takes, it's taking your body longer to ovulate, which isn't uncommon then. And I mean, for some women, sure, they ovulate within a month and then they, their cycles are regulating and, and in, in the sense that they're ovulating within 30 day stretches. Uh, but yeah, that's one of the, the tricky parts about it. Yeah, it's, it's definitely been, you know, a, a learning curve and, and really tracking it has been so eye opening and like really knowing like, okay, my period, my cycle this month is 43 days long, but you know, and I didn't ovulate until day 32. So seeing it all written out on the chart has been amazing. And it's just, it's really, really eye opening. And it's, it's been quite the journey. Mm -hmm. Well, and what I would say is, is probably the hardest part because you are still in the post pill transition phase fully. You are not out of the transition and you're, you can be in that transition for 18 months to two years. And I'm not saying this to be ridiculous. I'm saying it because when you look at what actually happens, if you're charting the kind of fallout, even the women who start ovulating within a month and have cycles that fall within a 30 day window, their parameters are still not necessarily all normal. So I've had number, numerous clients who've ovulated, you know, shortly after they come off the pill and their cycles are within the date range that we would consider to be normal. But in terms of their mucus patterns and their luteal phase length and all the different signs, I've never, so to be clear, I have never had a client who came off of birth control and every single cycle parameter was normal right away. That's not a thing. It doesn't happen. And so I, in your case, it, it can feel like, oh my gosh, there's something wrong with my cycles and all like, right. Cause it's like, there's yeah. so long and I'm not seeing any mucus. And so again, the like <laughs> tempted to freak out, right. What did I do to my body? And the hard part is to think of the kind of longer range. Like it's not always going to be this way. You are working on it. And the other thing is that you can take all the supplements, like the supplements, the eating healthy, the getting good sleep, the eating enough food and good food and all that. It's very, very important to support your body to restore um, normal cycling, but it doesn't mean that you don't go through the transition. Like you, there's no supplement that's going to make it so that you don't have to go through the transition. Right, right, exactly. And, and, and knowing that for sure and being like, okay, the supplements are just going to assist. Like yeah. it's not and going to magically help. <laughs> yeah. Well, and right. And I started the supplements in December in advance yeah before I came off in March to like, give it that time that you mentioned, because it doesn't happen overnight. And it's like, you got to give it three months or so to at least get them working. So that way, when you do come off, it's not as, it's not as, you know, much of running into like a brick wall kind of thing, but yes, it's, it's a process. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm looking forward to, um, since we're only halfway through the program, I'm looking forward to our future hot seat sessions and our additional sessions so we can keep tracking your progress and keep working on it together. Um, and so as we bring our interview to a close today, what would you want to say to the woman who's listening, maybe the woman who's just came into all this stuff and she's minding her business, tuned into a podcast, and like had her mind blown like you did when you were in the Barnes and Noble and you ran into read across Sarah Hill's book, what would you want her to know about birth control and the fertility awareness method and all this stuff? Is I think my, my biggest takeaway from it is don't, don't get frustrated with the learning process and to really deep dive into, you know, all of the information and in order to learn more and learn if it's the right move for you, for me, it just, it was, and it was like, I wanted to learn more and more and, um, you know, and then actually doing it was a bit of a step, but like, don't be daunted by it. There's, there's a sort of strength in being able to, I think, be comfortable in doing this on your own and not relying on a drug, but learn as much as you can. And your friends are going to think you're crazy. <laughs> Um, and also your friends are probably going to get very annoyed with you dropping knowledge bombs on them as my, my poor friends have had to, to learn, but it's, it's, it's a great way to, to take control of your body and, you know, be strong. So I, if it's the right move for you, I, I recommend just deep diving into it and just taking the plunge. Well, and for someone who is um, thinking about switching to birth control and they're not trying to get pregnant, they're actively trying not to get pregnant, what would you want them to know? For the people going on to birth control? 
the people coming off birth control, but they don't, or considering coming off the hormones, but they don't want to get pregnant. Yeah. Again, like this is a process and I'm one of those people not trying to get pregnant at all. And just, you know, you do such a great job of, of helping us understand when it is completely safe and that you won't get pregnant. And even just the reiteration of you can only get pregnant in a certain window. It's not the entire, the entire month and being taught things that we should have been taught as teenagers, but I'm sure health class grazed over, you know, just really learning the ins and out of ins and outs of the fertility awareness method is, is eye-opening in and of itself and realizing like, Oh, okay. I can still have sex and I can still not have babies. And it, it is effective. So it's, it's great. So do it. (laughs) Wonderful words to add on. Oh my goodness. Well, Liz, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your story and your experience. I know this episode is going to be so helpful to to the women who listen. Um, So thanks again for, for joining me. Of course. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com slash 358. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode with Liz. And, you know, at the time now that I'm releasing this episode, it's been a couple of months, actually, since we had that conversation. And so I thought it would be just helpful to take a couple minutes and talk a little bit more about that post pill transition phase that we were talking about on the podcast episode. So this is something if you've been tuning into the podcast, if you've read The Fifth Vital Sign, I talk about this a lot. Uh, because it's really important to understand kind of what the pill does and what it doesn't do. And so I I always try to be really clear, you know, when you look at the research, there's no evidence to suggest that the pill has a permanent negative effect on fertility. But what we do see is a transition period. So when you come off the pill, we see uh, a period that lasts anywhere from about 12 to 18 months. So about nine to 12 menstrual cycles where all of the parameters aren't exactly normal. So especially if you've been on the pill long term and in the research studies, long term is is typically defined as two years or more. But in cases like that, what we're seeing is it's not to say that it takes 12 months for your cycles to return or for you to start ovulating and having your period. But we're talking about the nitty gritty aspects of the cycle. So we're looking at the overall cycle length. We're looking at when ovulation is happening, you know, cervical fluid patterns, whether, you know, you have mucus and for how many days and also the length of the luteal phase. So the period of time between ovulation and your period. And so when I'm sharing that piece of information that it often takes even a year, sounds like such a long time for the cycles to normalize. I'm talking about all of those aspects pulled together into kind of those normal cycle parameters. And that's actually what I see, that it does take some time and it does take several cycles before everything really starts to normalize. But I think that the one thing that's really, really important is that there is always a point at which we can no longer blame the pill, essentially. So we can we can blame the pill. (laughs) You know, we can throw it on under the bus for during that initial post pill transition phase period. But once we get past that first, you know, nine to 12 cycles. So once we get past that first 12 months, 12 to 18 months, depending on what happened in your cycles, how long it took for you to get your first period. But essentially, once we get past that, you know, initial several cycles, if we're still continuing to see irregularities. So if after, let's say nine cycles, you're you're not seeing a, a movement toward normal, regular, kind of within that 24 to 35 day cycle range, if we're not really seeing, you know, a a movement towards that, at that point, we really have to start looking at if there are any other underlying factors that could be contributing. So just for the record, although the pill is associated with this temporary period of cycle irregularity that can last for a year or even a little bit more, depending on the situation, we do have to at some point look at other factors, especially if the cycles don't seem to be uh, normalizing. But with that said, if it's been like four months or if you've had four cycles and the cycles, your cycles haven't really normalized at that stage, we can't really jump to conclusions because it could, it could very well still be related to the pill. So I just thought I'd add that in because I think it's important to make those distinctions. And ultimately, if you're in this situation and you've come off of birth control and you're kind of seeing some wonky patterns, hopefully it gives you a bit of a guideline as to how to interpret it. Because as I said, it's helpful not to jump immediately to conclusions to, to really understand the difference between that you know temporary phase post pill 
if you have an underlying problem, <laughs> then it's going to persist. And, and that's basically the difference, you know, like after you've gone through that transition, if the cycles are still wonky, at that point, that's showing an increased likelihood of an, an underlying issue. So with that said, I want to thank you for tuning in to today's episode, for sharing this episode with friend. If, if you're hearing this episode and you can think of a few friends who would really benefit from listening to it, then certainly share the, uh, again, the the link to share is fertilityfriday.com slash 358. And with that said, I hope you have a wonderful week, weekend, whenever you're tuning into the show. And of course, as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.